start singing that, and I just, just encourage you just to place yourself before the Lord this morning. Just forget about everything else that's going on and just place yourself, imagine yourself standing there at the cross. He's died for you. All your sins are laid upon him and just worship him. Lord, we worship you. God, we praise your holy name. We thank you for your sacrifice, God. prophetic words and messages. You know, if, 
if if we have what what uh, we really want, that we want God to tell us everything, we may back up a little bit. Because if we knew the whole story, what it really meant to follow the Lord, um, we we may uh, not go in with it with our whole heart. So so God doesn't show us everything because we have to enter into our uh, relationship with faith and through life with faith. Uh, blind faith is a blessing. But see, there are characteristics that we must develop in order to let that blind faith carry us into that unknown. So I, I want to look at these carry characteristics. The unknown is obviously God's plan for our lives, whatever that may be. Um, there was this time last year, I had no idea I'd be standing here. That's right. Uh, there are places where God takes us. And there are, are times when we, we have to follow him. And there are times where we have to have faith. And this is the faith of, of the, the, the really unknown and, and what, what it is. And so, so we just need to have this blind faith and believe in him in order to, to accomplish what God has for our lives. So let's start in uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke here. Uh, chapter 1. Um, I'll be reading verse 30, uh, 26. I'll start in verse 26. And first we'll focus on 26 through 29. If you're there, say amen. Now the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. There, so there's four characteristics of faith that allowed Mary to be the mother of Jesus. And point one is she had a faith that responds to God's blessings with humility. And we see that in, in these, these verses. Let's pray one more time over the spoken word. Let's just pray that the Lord will just have his way. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for, for this time which we can focus, God, on you. You said that you are the word, God, and we honor your word today, God. And I pray that everything that needs to be spoken through your word, God, through me, I pray that you would just use me as a vessel, decrease the person, Jeb Dotson, God, and increase your spirit within me, Lord. And I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We see that God has his plan in place. He has his plan and he's ready to make that plan in action. We know that he had this plan from the beginning, but now he was ready to implement that plan. So he sends Gabriel to Mary for this and he takes the initiative. And in verse 26, we, we see that the, the angel shows up. First of all, Mary has a lineage from David. And she is from David, a direct line. So, so this is through David's son, Nathan. So the Messiah coming from her would fulfill and prophecy as spoken in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That the Messiah would come through the line of David. And so the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary in verse 27 and greeted her. And she said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the angel said to her. The Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled, the scripture says. What kind of, of greeting this was? So from the words of Gabriel, the next verse, verse 30, we see that her initial response is one of fear. What is this? What, and, and there's two reasons I see why this would trouble her. Number one, she lived in Nazareth. If you don't know about Nazareth, let me tell you, it was close to, I guess what you call the Roman training grounds, or maybe Roman boot camp, I guess if you want to call it. So what would happen is the Roman soldiers, when they would take leave, they would go to the nearest town. So Nazareth was turned into a very, by Jewish standards, very secular community. They would come and they would have a little coin in their hand and they would come to buy a drink and perhaps prostitutes or whatever they were looking for. And Nazareth kind of became a hub. So it was a, a Jewish community, but it was despised. It was sort of a red light district here. And so this is where Mary was. This is where, this is what she lived in. And so she was thinking when she, it's like, okay, are you in the right place? I see you're from the Lord, but do you know where you are? She's greatly troubled. See, 
the Lord could have chosen any place. There's many fine Jewish settlements and communities throughout the area, but he chose Nazareth of all places. Nazareth, a despised place. They looked down on Nazareth because they, there was some secular influence that was going on. That makes the fact that he overcame the world that much more meaningful. That he chose the red light district to be his home base. And this is where he inserted himself. He could have chosen others from other places. There are others in line in the lineage of David. I mean, he could have chosen Jerusalem. He could have, he could have chosen uh, so many other places for her to come from. But he chose Nazareth. So Mary could hardly believe that this teenager from Nazareth herself that could be called favored. And then there was the fact that she was poor. In the scriptures, it says, uh, and you read later in verse 48, Mary, when she magnifies the Lord, uh, she, she said that uh, the Lord chose her in spite of her low estate. She had uh, a low economic status, and she had a low self-esteem. She didn't think highly of herself, and she didn't have very little money. She didn't come from a family with a, with a lot of money. So these two things in themselves... Really, she negated herself. She disqualified herself, okay? Let's talk about that. We disqualify ourselves for service because of what we go through, what our past is, how we live, the side of town we live in, the job we have, the people we hang around. We disqualify ourselves automatically for the Lord's service. The Lord says, I want to use you, and we said, no, you really don't want to use me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I live. Surely there's a good doctor on the other side of the town or a lawyer or a, or a politician. I guess a Lord can use a politician as well. There's somebody other than myself that you can use, Lord. So we disqualify ourselves. So the very first thing I want to tell you as we're getting into this is don't disqualify yourself for his service. When we disqualify ourselves, we say, no, God. And he says, are you sure he'll push? And you say, no, God, I can't. He will find somebody else. He's looking to bless people. And by blessing people, it means to use them as a vessel. And so, so we just need to come to God open and believe and just have faith that God can use us where we are. Even if we are in Nazareth. Even if we have been through a lot of stuff, and we have a lot of issues. Amen. Who has had issues in the past? I believe everybody's had some issues. Amen. God can work through your issues, and that will later become your testimony. Because your testimony is what he wants to give you. In fact, we find throughout the word of God, he loves a good, bad case scenario. And he loves to take that, and he, and he wants to, at the end, before, and by the time it's all said and done, he wants to say, look now. Look at what you have despised. Now look what is, it, it has turned into. So she disqualified herself in her heart. She was troubled. But God will use that. As he was begin to work on her, she just dis responded with this blessing with complete humility. The Lord has chosen me. He has saved me despite all the sinners around me. I have left the sinners and now I, I have been brought up by him and I belong to him. And that is what I used to be and I, I, I'm just so thankful that I'm not that over there. And so it, it's, it's not a sense of pride. The Lord doesn't want us to have that. We should just be humble with the fact of where we came from, where he's taken us, and where we're going. And that is something that she had. We don't want to limit God's choice, though. By limiting his choice, he will move on. I do believe with all my heart that there is another virgin waiting. Because we are not robots. We, we are people of free will. She could have said no. She could have said, get out of my house. You're crazy. I, I, I really, I, I don't want anything to do with you. And I believe God would not press the issue. I believe he would find somebody else. He will. I believe that. We go into our next passage of scripture. Going to Luke 1 in verse 30. We're continuing on. 
So then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father's father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mm. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Our second point is she had a faith that looks for more instruction from God. The angel of the Lord says, fear not. Fear not, you have found favor with God. This means don't be so perplexed. I am at the right town. I have arrived here, and I'm talking to the right person. I know. This is what the angel would have said. Now, she in herself is, was afraid and scared at this point. But the angel said, I, I know where I'm at. He's just basically telling her, accept this grace. Accept this grace that you've been given. And let's move on to the details. The angel explains that she's going to conceive. The child's going to be named Jesus. Now, Jesus in the Greek version is Joshua. And we see Joshua in the Old Testament. So, Joshua means Savior or the salvation of Jehovah. So, Jesus means Savior or the salvation of Jehovah because it comes from that name Joshua. And he said, this is who... This is his name. And then the angel describes the miracle of Jesus and begins to give uh, prophetic words concerning the ministry of Christ and, and explaining about Jesus right there. He said, he will be great. Number one uh, is his human nature, he describes. He will be great. That's great among men. He will be great. Number two is he will be the son of the most, most high. That describes his divine quality. He will be great among men, but he will be, be great in, in the kingdom of God. He's going to be the son of the most high. And number three, it speaks, it's, he talked about uh, prophecy being fulfilled. Continuing the line of David. And his kingdom will never end, just as God promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So these three things the angel begins to describe to Mary. And I imagine at this moment, this is a very overwhelming thing for her. This was, first it was, you are highly favored, and then, okay, you, you are going to be with child, and then he's going to be great. And he's actually going to be, okay, hold on to yourself. This is going to be the son of God you're going to be carrying in your womb. And then this is going to be prophetic word fulfilled, and she would know this prophetic word. She would know what this meant because she, this was handed down to sons and daughters for generations that there would be a Messiah. So she was probably very overwhelmed. That, that this was going to be her baby. And she got this revelation all at a moment. See, Mary could have even easily gotten lost in the promises of, that were given her, but her reaction was to look for more instruction. She does this in the form of a question. How's this going to happen if I'm a virgin? Mary's question can be compared almost with, with Paul's Question. He was on the road to Damascus. He was riding his horse. Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus. The power blows him off the horse. And he's first thing he says is, Lord, who are you? And then Jesus starts talking. And he's laying on his back. And he says, what do you want from me, Lord? This is the, this is the, the same question that is asked just in, in another form. Paul that day realized as he was persecuting the power that saved him, and it changed his life forever. It was a, well, what is it that you want me to do now? Because you completely disrupted my life, and obviously my life has changed. I'll never be the same. So what now, God? What now? What shall I do, Lord? And that's Acts chapter 2, 22, verse 10, if you want to look that on the side and, and, and read that in the book of Acts. In order that our faith in the Lord may grow into maturity, it's important for us to ask the question that Mary asks. The question looks for further instruction. It says, can you teach me, O Lord? I just want to be clay in your hand. Yes, I just want to be putty, God. Whatever you want to mold me yes. into, I, that's what I want to be. So what is it from here? You have changed me. You have come down. You have set me free. You have set me apart. Now what? Hmm. I'm looking. 
looking for more instruction, God. That is the right response. When you were saved, no matter where that was in your life, if you were five years old or if you were 45 years old, from that point on, your job was to start looking for more instruction. And the day you stop looking for instruction from the Lord is the day you stop growing. And that is, that is as far as you go with God because when you get to the point where you think you have all the instruction you need, God says, are you sure that's all you want? You don't want to see any more of me? You want to see my miracles? You want to see my healings? You want to see all the things I have planned for you? That's as far as you go. Okay, I wish that wasn't the case. The day we stop looking for instruction is that's as, that's as far as we go with God. We're to constantly be looking for instruction from him. Give me a word, God. Lord, what, what now? I, I am your servant. How can I serve you better? What can I do for you, God? Instructions from God and his word equals action. And that is where do we go from here? How, how, do, how can we serve you better? It shows our commitment and our dedication to doing what God says to us through his word. Anyone who has no intention to follow the will of God will never ask this question. Somebody who just wants to feel good. That they have, have read some of, some of the word of God and they, they have showed up and they have done what's required of them. They would never ask that question. How can I serve you more, God? What more? We need to always be looking for instruction from the Lord. It's so important. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. That should be our prayer. That's the faith that God can use. Because that means that, no, God, I, I know I have my plan in life. I know that I want to I want to get married and I, I want to have a family. And I do want to be successful and God's okay with that. But when we put his agenda, amen, above our agenda, great things can happen. Great, amazing things can happen as he begins to use us. God can take a town like Nazareth. And take a girl who didn't have a very bright future. She was betrothed to Joseph, who's a carpenter. He was going to start his carpenter business. And she was probably already drawing out the plans of the house that he was going to build her. You know how the ladies are. That's one of the most stressful things for a man is building a house and being married. I suggest maybe if you can, build it first and get married. Because of all the decisions, the paint color or whatever. Let's... Go so, move on. I'm gonna do myself. Uh, moving on to uh, verse 35, we'll, we'll get my, my third point. And the angel answered and said to her, "The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be called the Son of God." Let me just say that again: the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, so, say it for me, nothing is impossible. Let's say it again. With God, nothing is impossible. That is powerful right there. That power of glory, hallelujah. That means no matter what. I mean, we can get ourselves just completely wrapped up in issues and troubles but with God nothing is impossible we, we can take that we can run with it that's a shouting scripture right there our, our third point is a faith that believes nothing is impossible for God the angel went to her here and answered began to answer her question of how it's possible that she had not known a man described an event that is much like the account in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 where the spirit hovered, the spirit of God hovered over the waters. It's, the angel said that the spirit would overshadow her just like in that Genesis creation event of the spirit hovering over the waters. The spirit would hover over her and creation was going to take place within her. The child would be inserted into her womb. God was introducing into her all the creative power that was used in creation. 
It will be placing it within her womb. Only by his grace was she going to be able to survive such an event. This was going to be something that she should die. She, she should have never even be allowed for this to happen. That, that the very, all the power, see in the beginning, it says in the beginning was, was God. And he was there, but they were there. The Trinity was there. Both God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they were all, all there. And now he was going to be inserted into her womb. This, this should have immediately just destroyed her completely. But with God, it's possible only by the grace. Just like only by the grace that we are able to receive the Holy Spirit. This should absolutely kill us. We should not even be able to receive, be saved, and receive a portion of the Spirit. Let me just preach on this just for a second. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Come on, wave at me. I mean, we're Pentecostal. Okay. We believe this. We believe that the Holy Spirit can actually dwell within a shell of my body here. This should be something that would destroy us completely. That all of the whole creation, the power of God deep within is going to be in me. And he will walk with me. And the Spirit's going to be in me. Hallelujah. And he's going to be in me. Praise God. And he's going to walk with me. He's going to overcome every, everything in my life. And he's going to just control me. As I am giving myself. It's not a control that it's against my will. I will it. And I say, God. in you. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been baptized in His name. And now I am operating not like I was born. I am operating in a state where, a state where the very power of God is within me. The very power of God was within you. Don't take it for granted. If you've been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, that, that is just something that's just for you. To just make you feel good and give you the goosebumps. That is for power. Powerful living. This is for a, a powerful, overcoming, conquering world. But with God, all things are possible. He's in me. And he's in you. And it's, it's an event just like the event that happened to Mary. Should have been instant death. But by the grace of God alone, the Holy Spirit resides. Having this power is a great blessing. And also a great responsibility. Did Mary know what was at stake? Did she know the price that she would have to pay for this indwelling, this insertion of, of the Messiah within her? Having the power and the majesty residing within us. Do we know what it really means to have the Spirit of God within us? Do, do we even know we have a concept? I don't think we will even know truly until we get to heaven what it really means. The, the great uh, power and, and just the, the great expectation that God has what we would do with it. And I believe there's going to be a lot of teaching. Is, and we're going to be saying, what it, I, I wish I would have. It's going to be that. It's going to be, I wish I would have. I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known what was deep within me. I wish I would have known after I was saved and the deposit of the Holy Spirit that was just given to me. I wish I would have known there's going to be a lot of that going on because God is going to make all things known at the end. When you receive the blood of Christ as forgiveness and made a place for His Spirit to dwell in you, did you know the great responsibility on your part? It was more than just escaping hell's flames. Amen? It was more than just a fire insurance policy that you bought into. It was more than that. Did you realize that you were to nurture the Spirit of God within you as was placed within you, making room for the Spirit of God to grow? To not only make a place for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords within you, but to allow Him to actually begin to work in your life. If you would have known this, would you have said, yes, Lord? If you knew the true meaning of what it meant, would you have said, yes, Lord? That's the, that's the question that we have with Mary. Would she have known? But how is it possible? How is it possible that we are to be indwelled? How is it possible with God? 
all things are possible. It's by His grace we're able to receive Him. It's by faith that we're able to acknowledge that we are lost without Him. But in Him all things are possible. You can take a person such as myself, such as yourself, and just make it a place for His Spirit. This faith, if you look at the Word, is something that Mary did not have. I don't want to mislead you. I said three things she had, but actually she didn't have this. She did not have this faith that is nothing is impossible for God. She didn't currently have it. But the angel gave herself for this for a reason. It was a seed. It was a deposit that she was given that day because this would be needed for her to get through life of raising a Savior. She would need this when the innkeeper told Joseph, there's no room at the inn. You're going to have to sleep with the animals in the stable. She would need this, that nothing's impossible for God. She would need this. When the boy was 12 years old, got away from them on their trip to Jerusalem, they looked for days, finally found him in the temple. She would need this to keep from killing the boy. How many parents would have that can say amen that you actually could say that, you know, it was very close. They almost did not make that next birthday. It would, she would need this. When she came up, and, and, he's, and it's almost, to me, it's almost like a smart out comment. I'm just about my father's business. You know, he just do his head like that. And, and, and it's just everything about her to keep from, you know, slapping the Messiah. You just don't do that. So she would just need restraint because this would be a, a different child. She would need this when he was tried for crimes he did not commit, drugged off, led down the street, nailed to the cross, and hung up. She would need this word that with God all things are possible. She would need this so the angel planted this seed of faith within her for her entire life of what she would need to accomplish everything to be the true mother of the Messiah, the, the true mother of Christ. She would need the word that with God all things are possible, even raising the Savior of the world. We need this word to nurture the Holy Spirit within us and to just use the Holy Spirit as it was meant to be, just to envelope us completely and live a life of power and live a life of triumph in Christ. Number four. We go to verse 38. This is my last scripture. It said, Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. My fourth point, final point, is she had a faith, and we need a faith, that submits totally, completely to the will of God. Let it be as you say, Lord. Just let it be as you say. No matter what that means, let it be as you say. She called herself a maidservant. I, would, I believe today Mary would just be just appalled at the level of the people hold her up to, the statues and praying through her name. She never wanted this. I think she would just be completely in shock how some people place her up on a pedestal of being the mother of, of Christ. I don't think she ever wanted that. She would never approve of these statues, the prayers that went up in her name. Her response to the angel made it clear that she would lay aside all hopes and dreams of a normal Hebrew teenager's life, of everything that she had, everything that she wished for, everything that she wanted just to be married and have a happy family and have this home together that she was laying that aside and she said, let it just be according to your word, Lord. She placed her trust in God that when Joseph found out that he would somehow understand. She had faith that her name would not be ruined. She knew her purity would be questioned. She knew the child would be called illegitimate. All these things going through her mind. And yet she said, let it be according to your will, God. Well, just, let's just go with your plan and just put my plan on hold. Even worse, according to Mosaic law, she risked being stoned to death. Death itself was hovering over her by saying, let it be according to your will, God. Mm. I'll just follow your plan. Mm. 
Mm. Even unto death. I'm going to follow your plan, God. How many can just say that? That is just a statement that even unto death, God, there are places around the world where people are being executed just for being a believer in Christ. We cannot forget. We cannot forget that we are just so free here. Just like Brother Thomas said, we are so free here. We have freedom here. I can, I can hang my head out of the parking lot and shout, I am free in Christ's name. Nobody's going to come with a gun and come throw me in a van and drive me down the road and, and make me dig my own hole and kill me, but it happens in other places. Mm. We are free. She was placing herself in a position where it did mean death, and yet... She made the decision anyway. One of our most important applications today is that we, as Christians, should be willing to accept God's will for us, no matter how costly, no matter how costly that is, we should just be willing to accept this. None of us will be asked to face what Mary faced. That will never be asked of any one person again. But there should be circumstances that, that we could be painted in a light that is maybe not so popular. It's not so popular to go to that church, or it's not so popular to, to be a believer on the job site. You can be placed in those circumstances among your friends and family and relatives. We just need to follow God no matter what, according to His will. Our responsibility is to obey God, regardless of the personal consequences. It, it is the work of the kingdom that counts, and we should be willing to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, God. As I close, Hannah, can you come up and just you, you can start playing when, when I'm ready? I want to uh, I want to close with this uh, this illustration. There was a sermon from Martin Luther. It's an old sermon. I, I had to change some of the wording a little just so you can understand it. But in this sermon, he gives this illustration, and he says the devil had a great anniversary party in which his emissaries were convened to report on the results of their several missions that year. One demon said, I let loose the wild beasts of the desert on a caravan of Christians, and their bones are now bleaching on the sands. What of that, says the devil? Their souls were all saved. Another came forward and said, I drove the east wind against a ship freighted with Christians, and they all drowned. What of that, said the devil? Their souls were all saved. A third demon came forward and spoke up. For ten years, I tried to get a single Christian to fall asleep and stop worrying about the will of God. And I succeeded, and I left him so. Then the devil shouted, and the demons of hell sang for joy. Luther went on to say, one of the tricks of Satan is to make us believe the submission of God means a spiritual stupor. Far from it. It's a battle. It's a resistance from Satan himself. By being obedient to God is one of the most powerful weapons we have. It is not just stepping in line and just being a submissive individual. It's power. When we submit to the will of God, we are attacking the enemy lines right on the front lines of the enemy who the, he goes around like a roaring lion to seek and to destroy. Let it be according to your will, O oh God. That should be a prayer today. That is a prayer that, that we should have as we are getting together and just remembering Him this season. Lord, gifts are not the most important thing this season. Can you just say amen? Say gifts are not, not important. Believe me, if my family gives me nothing, it's okay. Just the fact that I have them with me and we can celebrate together. And we can just get the true meaning of Christmas. If I can just hammer that through to anybody around me who will listen. That God came into the world for a mission. And he came not to just have a great life, but to die. He came to live and to die. Mary did know this. She didn't know what all that meant. But she said, according to your word, as we close the service, Lord, if there's any need, God, I pray that you would just meet these needs, God. And as they go throughout the week, I pray all this.
special blessing on each and every person here. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with them in their jobs, God. Be with them in their families. Be with each and every person here and give them the strength to walk in victory. In Jesus' name.